Well, we are going to start our next panel, which is five things startups should know about privacy. I am excited to introduce my panelists. So first, I would like you to meet Denise Taylor. She is a co-founder and CEO of Priva. Denise helps companies navigate the opportunities and challenges around implementing the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA, and other international laws around privacy. Welcome, Denise. I'm looking forward to hear your tips. Thank you. Um, and uh, Jishnu Menon, um, who is Associate General Counsel at Mozilla, and Jishnu fights to protect data privacy and keep the internet open. Jishnu leads Mozilla's legal team to support all of the business, product, engineering, marketing, and operational team's legal need. Welcome, Jishnu. Thank you. Well, um, let's talk about it. Let's start with the general state of what privacy means to start up. Um, Big companies. Big companies have money, resources, and they spend a lot of time and money around privacy, awareness, training, policies, tools, procedures. They have money, interest, they have shareholders um, who are requiring them to do that. And uh, many more, com more and more companies recognize privacy as a business differentiator. But I think, what about startups? Are they different? Should they even care about privacy when they have a business to run? And a startup business is a very big and challenging task. So can you guys talk about privacy for startups? Should they even worry about it? And if they do, where do they start and when? At what point? Well, I'll start with yes, they need to care about privacy. Um, I understand that the challenge is uh, it costs you know, it costs resources and energy, and you can't do all the things that you might want to build in right up front. But uh, I think it's a it's it's much better to think about it up front than to wait to fix it after the fact. Um, and then I would say also with startups, you know, you're out raising capital, and uh, the and you want partners, and your partners are going to say, are you compliant? And just signing a form and saying that you're compliant with all the rules. Uh, especially if you're in the children's space, isn't isn't good enough. Uh, so uh, I think VCs and others are are looking for the startups to have some semblance of grown-up uh, behavior when it comes to privacy and security. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the risk side of it. I think that's incredibly important to manage risk, uh, even when you're a growing organization. Uh, but backing up and looking at kind of privacy holistically, I think it also drives, as you mentioned, some of the top end um, for a startup's uh, business, right? Especially when you're a new brand mm -hmm. and you're establishing yourself, uh, being more trusted with the way that um, users view you. Uh, I think being transparent about your data practices, uh, being engaging with your users, and um, thinking about security and minimization, all those things serve to bolster the brand in addition to lowering risk, so yeah. Right from the very beginning. And, and data retention for, for these guys as well, um, because they have this, this feel that they need to gather all the data they can, so minimization. But then uh, we'll come in to work with a startup and find, well, you know, why are you even collecting that? And where are you keeping it? How long are you keeping it? And they haven't thought about some of that. So just simple, basic step back and say, what do you really need to collect? Uh, and making sure that you understand and, and the other people in the startup understand that it's important. Because if it's just the CEO worrying about it, then nobody's going to follow. In your practice, do you spend more time educating them around culture and awareness versus? Well, you know, I, I work with companies of all sizes. Uh, we operate a COPPA Safe Harbor program, so companies will come to us to understand the implications under COPPA and now the GDPR. Uh, it, you know, the training aspect, we'll be asked to do workshops and to, and to bring the marketing and IT and the policy people together and sort of operate as the uh, referee between the different groups and make sure folks understand what their responsibilities are. Um, but, you know, with the little guys, it's first get to the executives, make sure they understand that this can actually trickle, you know, break the veil and come straight to them if they get these things wrong, and then giving them the tools to educate their staff as well. Okay, so I'm a startup. I understand the value of privacy, and I get it. My next step. There are so many laws and regulations. In addition to frameworks, numerous frameworks around different countries, and how do I know what law 
create my privacy program? What's my next step? So um, I think, again, stepping back from the compliance aspect of it, um, thinking about your holistic chain of events between your user and yourself, uh, when you design your product, being transparent, those things start to go a long way to address the top line of even the compliance aspect uh, of handling the risk there. Uh, certainly, you should know the laws of the area you are in, uh, California, for example. Uh, and if you are international, as most you know, online businesses tend to be, I think Europe is a big, uh, is another big source um, of, of laws. And I'm not sure if you've, if there's any. Oh, kind they're, of they're running with their hair on fire oh, right yeah. now with the GDPR. Yeah. Um, no, so you know, uh, first of all, knowing who your audience is, right? Are, you know, are you dealing with minors? And if you are, then you better understand what rules are out there related to minors. Are you healthcare? Or are you, you know, uh, financial? Do you have to worry about Graham Leach or HIPAA? Um, so understanding your audience, and in the world of COPPA, uh, you know, you would say, well. I'm, uh, I'm, I might be the fastest growing app on the planet for kids first grade and above, but my privacy policy says you must be 13 and over. So understanding that all of your marketing efforts are saying one thing and your policies are saying something else, at some point there's going to be you know, a break there. So understanding the jurisdictions that you're in, the verticals that you're associating with, the age. And you know, one last thing on the COPPA front is uh, you know, you may be child directed, but are you child directed primary audience, seven to 12 year olds? Or are you child directed mixed audience where you have preschoolers and parents or nine to 15, so you're crossing the, the age barrier? You know, what does that mean about the flow in which you can gather data and whether you have to engage parents or not along the way? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think when you're a smaller company, um, you mentioned going to executives uh, when you're talking to startups, accountability becomes kind of a really important thing to make sure you know who in the company is thinking about this and has their eye on the ball. Uh, because it's easy for everyone to say, it's your problem, it's your problem, it's your problem. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think another big one for startups is understand what is personally identifiable information. So in the children's space, your pics, your audio, your video, device identifiers, anything that you can use to locate a, a user and communicate your marketing message. I mean, COPPA is a marketer's law at the end of the day. So understanding the taxonomy of privacy and security mm -hmm. as it relates to your business is a really great starting point. Right, and just not only understanding what personal information is, right, but how can you align it with your geography and your jurisdictions because it's slightly still a little bit different. I think we get more aligned and universally, but um, I think there is still a difference between what it means here and versus in the U.S., uh, in the EU or In the South last America. panel, uh, somebody, they just mentioned that um, this little piece of text that says, okay, we don't have to worry about foreigners uh, or another, you know, you know, out somebody outside of your jurisdiction. Well, in COPPA, that's not the case at all. If you're a U.S. company and you uh, attract 12 and under, then you're supposed to provide COPPA protections to children not only in the US, but abroad. And any company that's operating inside of our uh, jurisdiction is supposed to provide those protections to at least US kids. So in that case, um, it does matter. Yeah, and, and that international question is, is really significant when you're providing products all over the world. Um, and even us, when we kind of do our compliance work uh, in each of the major jurisdictions that we enter into, you'll notice major differences even when laws are related to each other uh, by kind of um, almost like genealogy, if you think about it that way. Like, so South America's privacy laws are heavily depend, uh, heavily not based on, but inspired by at the very least, mm -hmm. the EUs, but they skew uh, and they're different. And so um, that's why we find backing up to the overall minimization, transparency, and security aspects um, really start to get you down the road, uh, mm -hmm. even when it comes to kind of differences in laws and how they apply. Well, thank you. So know what data you collect, where you collect it, know your audience. So this is a very, very important starting point, I would say. Yeah. So can we talk about frameworks a little bit? Um, because frameworks, it's a nice, in my opinion, very nice starting point, how you can look at your privacy culture and program overall. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend um, one or a few frameworks that startups can look at before they even start digging into privacy? 
Well, I'd love to jump in here and give the uh, IDESG, which is the Identity Ecosystem Steering Group, a plug. They've done a lot of work with uh, you know hundreds of it's people yep, coming together and SALS, which is the uh, framework that you can go in and, and see where do you stand up against it. It's self-assessment, so I think it's a really great learning tool. And then uh, my second plug would be for the Miners Trust Framework. Uh, NIST uh, funded that effort. We were one of the pilots under uh, NSTIC, the National Strategy for Trusted Identity in Cyberspace. So this framework, this Miners Trust Framework, and it is an identity trust framework. It lays out the legal, technical, and operational policies necessary to operate an identity federation where children's data may come into play. And laws like COPPA and FERPA and SOCEPA and all these, you know, all the laws that HIPAA that feed the framework. Um, and so, you know, think of it in identity as fi like you would in financial. MasterCard, you know, there's a set of rules. Who are the banks? Who are the merchants? The consumers off looking for everything to work, you know, uh, so everybody can work together in these frameworks. In identity, you have identity providers, companies and organizations that know who we are. And you have merchants or, or publishers who need to gather data from us and, and the poor consumers in the middle trying to figure out where they can you know, ship their data and how they can get it from one point to the other without having to enter so much of it themselves. And then an assessor framework. So PCI compliance and financial. Mm -hmm. In the identity world, you have assessors who are assessing against the framework as well. That's out at the oixnet.org. And... Um I'm going to just put a plug for uh, when we started working with startups around understanding how to elevate kind of the broader level of um, data practices mm -hmm. around our ecosystem, we realized there's actually a big tax and taxonomy difference between the privacy world and the startup world. Um, and so we, um, because you don't think about risk in the same way um, as a small company, you, you have to consider it holistically against all of the other risks. Like, uh, am I going to make payroll? Right. And so, yeah. um, and so, when you when you frame it in that way, uh, having kind of detailed taxonomy can actually be can actually be a barrier to entry. So the uh, CEO will have to like become a privacy expert before they can actually implement a privacy thing. And so, uh, we launched this um, initiative called the Lean Data Practices, which is which are actually design principles. Um, and so they they follow Ian? Lean Data Practices. Um, uh, we actually, we just blogged about it this morning. Um, uh, we released them about a year ago and we're going to rev them this year. And the whole idea behind them is to kind of strip away as much taxonomy as possible and get down to kind of the three major things you can do as a company that would address these risks and specifically targeting kind of um, users as a primary mm -hmm. beneficiary, um, but done in a way that um, kind of shows the upside and not just the downside. Because uh, again, a lot of these companies are thinking more about upside than they are about downside. You have to as an entrepreneur. Um, you're all, you're, you're, the odds are stacked against you at every single step. And so um, we're actually finding a lot of really interesting traction through that. Interesting. Well, thank you for sharing. Definitely. I'm going to check it out. Um, it's on the Mozilla homepage. Um, actually, if you go to our main homepage, there's even a, a link. There's also a, a toolkit. Uh, and a GitHub repo with, um, you know, a set of code and um, some documents that you can use to operationalize it. Again, trying to be very lean and focusing on the three major things. So um, it doesn't have as much detail as a lot of the other uh, uh, things on, on purpose. People will actually give it a go then. To at least if, if it's kick it off. overwhelming, you don't even know where to start. I so agree. Focus is very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prioritization, right? Knowing where your risk is and uh, focusing on addressing it. So, okay, so we got our understanding, we are a startup and we understand what laws applies to us, we got the framework. How do we know what policies, procedures, trainees we are required to have, let's say as a HIPAA company or PCI data company versus nice to have? Can you share your thoughts around this area, specific policies and procedures, how to navigate what I should build? Well, I, 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 um, I keep going back to children because that's the, the sure. place that I come from. Um, you know, when, when we work with a company uh, under the Safe Harbor program, we're basically doing a self helping them to do a self-evaluation. So it's not just they, they now know they have the laws, but it's, uh, you know, who are the third parties you're operating with? 
give us all your agreements so we can help you read through them and find out whether or not you've covered yourself. Are you communicating to the big uh, networks that your child directed? Because if you don't, then you're, you're the one who's in trouble. If you communicate to them properly, then it's downstream. They have to, to follow Just, and do the right mm -hmm. thing. Um, helping, you know, the, writing the policies and the notices and doing it in a way, um, you know, to, interesting thing in the kids space, people are like, well, we won't get, gather any data, but we need to get mom's consent. So we, they don't ask for the child's first name. Well, the law says you can't ask for the child's first name. So if I'm a mom and something pops in my inbox and says, some kid wants your consent, I'm less likely to open it than if it says, you know, Johnny would like, you know, to get your consent. So helping them understand how to actually mm -hmm. get conversion and people through the process. Just some tips. And, um, at Mozilla, we basically, I think, touch every uh, uh, privacy law except uh, HIPAA uh, so far. Mozilla Health coming mm -hmm. next year. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it can be really hard to know. In fact, it's pretty counterintuitive mm -hmm. when you hit a new uh, uh, law, especially if you cross borders into other jurisdictions. There, for example, in South America, video game uh, violence, uh, and there's some privacy laws around that. Um, you wouldn't know unless you were in the space. So I think mm -hmm. it's very useful to find a, a great consultant or a great uh, legal kind of uh, advisor to help you at least scope, you know, what's the zone, where, what am I in? PCI mm -hmm. can apply to you even if you don't think it does a lot of times. Absolutely, time. absolutely. I'll just add one on the GDPR front, right? They now have a, a minors aspect to that law, but it's a little more complicated because it's 15 and under, not 12 and under, like in the U.S., but each member state can bump it down from 12, you know, from 15 to 12. So as an organization, you're going to have to say, oh, is this a kid in Germany or in France? And, you know, apply the different rules based on their ages. That certainly adds complexity and I think drives towards frameworks that can help, um, help them navigate those, those rules. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's talk about outsourcing. So outsourcing plays a critical role in the data privacy world, especially uh, with startups, because in order to be efficient and cost effective, a lot of startups outsource their functions abroad or to different vendors, different companies. It used to be that many regulations, many privacy regulations would apply to you as a company or to your vendors, but with GDPR and some other privacy laws, situation has changed. What would you recommend? If I am a startup, what would you recommend to me? How can I better manage my outsourcing practices? I think that, um, so this is a hard problem, not just for startups, right? Um, I think that you really have to read the material that's out there. Uh, you also have to, you know, there's a sense of trust with the company. Um, and so if you know that a company has had issues before, unfortunately, you're going to have to consider that as a part of your decision-making process. And this is so common that actually the rev of, I mentioned our lean data practices, we're actually doing kind of a marketing-oriented rev mm. that has to do with um, what is a lightweight vendor review slash terms you can sign people up to. Like that's that's actually fairly common, right, this, this, mm -hmm. this issue. And so um, I think without signing your vendors up to some terms, and without kind of doing your diligence in the back end, it's very hard to manage this risk. Yeah. Um, spot check. Like, you know, tell them and then go and see whether they actually listen to what you said. Uh, getting through the agreements, so, so difficult. Again, in the, in, the, in the kids' space, you are responsible for, you know, the third parties that you're using, and so you have to properly mm -hmm. notify them. Um, don't just look at what other people are doing and think, oh, well, that big company's got it right, so I'll go use the vendors they're using. Well, uh, you know, one of our clients pays extra to their vendor, their analytics company, to ensure that they don't use the data for any other reason so that they don't have any downstream compliance mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then get a, you gotta get, you've got to get a consultant or, a, or you know, uh, lawyers are expensive for startups. Um, so first, common sense, just read the basics, but then, you know, get some professional advice, even if it's just an advisor on your team. Yeah, and it's very important not only to have a legal perspective, but also a business perspective. And that's what I noticed that consultant brings um, to the table. They able to assess the situation holistically. And sometimes privacy, it's not only laws and regulations, it's doing the right thing. It's being open and transparent. And you can't put the legal stamp on it. It's usually, it's just like, does it feel right? If it doesn't, it's probably not good practice. Yeah, Did a you lot want of, to say something? Well, I was just going to plus one that. A lot of it 
Uh, and that's, again, why we don't start with the compliance aspect of it, because a lot of it has to do with beyond that uh, mm -hmm. uh, step. And the business side, especially when it comes to your vendor relationships, is ultra important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, my next question is about data minimization. Uh, we hear it everywhere, and GDPR, the new European regulations, talk a lot about it. So is less is more? What, I mean, how do you draw the line? Because data is money, right? This is the new value, and um, you need to collect data in order to be successful. It doesn't matter if you start up a big company. So how do you navigate this field? Well, um, I was thinking uh, about this the other day, and uh, some products can't be built without a lot of granular data about people. You literally cannot build them. Uh, some algorithms require them. Uh, and in other cases, that's not the case. So I, I think the issue is really about uh, looking at what you have and how you collect data and how you use it, being mindful about that, and then making decisions that are tailored to your business. Um, and again, I mean, I hate to say this, but it goes back to having a um, really holistic approach uh, to, to the data that you collect. And yes, you want to collect as, as lean of a, a set of data as you can because all of the risks that we mentioned today, all of them relate to how much data you have. The more you have, the greater your risk profile. Right. Um, so we, we operate a customer identity and consent management service in the, in the COPPA space specifically. And so when we're talking to a client, it's once we know, well, what are the age groups? What are the roles? What data do you need against that role just to operate? Okay. And then what are the features and functionality that you're asking for consent for? And break each one of those down. Well, you want to send a catalog to the child, then that means you need a mailing address. So identify the data attributes that map to the features and functionality and the role types and collect it in line. Let the consumer understand that when they're giving you an email address, it's not to share it with 10 other people, but it is associated to the actual you know, newsletter that they'd like to receive. And so that's what we've done, and we've automated that into um, a framework so that people are seeing it as they're, as they're entering the information. I mean, you risk also just not collecting enough, in, like the first name when I was mentioning, and then you can't get anybody to click through and do what they need to do. So some common sense has to, you know, Yeah, there's a real well. there's real tension there, right? And, and I love the idea of the audit. I think that's right. I mean, some cases you can get super granular, in some cases even doing a light audit Mm -hmm. uh, will get you to better decisions about your data. Mm -hmm. And then last, think about the data you're creating. So again, in the children's space, you know, a display name. So great, you want to operate a single sign-on across all your brands. Are you encouraging the child to maybe change their display name across the different brands? Or have you now created new personally identifiable information through your own uh, in engagement with the, the user? I wanted to ask you a question about data mapping and um, so data mapping and any tool that you can recommend to startups to better understand the data because in order to minimize you got to understand what you're collecting where you're collecting how many systems you have who has access to those systems so it gets really granular are there any tools that may be available for free um, in the space or maybe some other basic tools that startups can afford to purchase? I know that NIST is doing some really great work here and they're and they're reaching out to startups, big companies, small companies. Um, I mean, they're the ones who set the standards and uh, technology for security, and now they've done that with privacy, and they've got worksheets that you can use, and they would love for people to use the, the, the materials and, and then give them feedback about how, how it uh, helped. And I'm going to plug that lean data thing again, because that's a part of the, the toolkit. Again, designed to be very basic, so not as thorough as the things you necessarily listed, um, but even, again, some thought into what are we collecting, where does this stuff live, who has access to it, makes a huge difference in the outcomes of your decisions around data, and ultimately the trust that your products bring. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of more minutes. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Risk assessment, this is another thing that many companies do. Do you think it's an, it's an important step for startups? And how often, if it is, how often do you recommend assessing your privacy program or privacy functions? Is it an annual prog process? Is it um, every other month because you start up? But it's important, while everything is moving and shaking, it's important to 
stay up to date. What are your thoughts about risk assessment? Well, under, under our program, we're doing an, an annual audit, which is required, but we're also doing quarterly check-ins. And we're saying to our clients, treat us like your fractional chief privacy officer. If you're going to add a contest, then do the data mapping on each and every feature as you're adding it. And, and don't make it a once a year kind of thing you have to go back to. I can't tell you how many times we'll review something, it's all in compliance, and then you know a month later they do another push and there's the privacy policy link back, you know, not prominent and standing out because the engineer didn't know that it really mattered or thought it didn't look right. So you have to constantly be on these things. And I think you know, finding somebody in the organization who's gonna be a champion um, you don't want to be a bottleneck, but you want somebody looking in certainly more often than once a year. Yeah, I, I would definitely plus one both the accountability and the product life cycle. Okay. I mean, it needs to be a part of that, and catching it on the front end is so much easier than doing an audit on the back end. And I think, um, I think you mentioned having cross-functional team. It's very important. It's very important for privacy to build for any discipline, but I think for privacy, especially since it's collaboration among different business lines, um, creating cross-functional teams when you do an assessment or data mapping, uh, not only important to make sure you get everything right at a startup or any company, but also important to build champions who are going to speak up on your behalf while you're not in the room. Um, insurance, I think we have a couple of minutes. Um, do you recommend um, cyber insurance? anything like this because I know it takes only one time to ruin your reputation while you can legally protect yourself with agreements and shifting responsibility and mitigating your risk if something happens and even if you are a small tiny player you will be on the front of newspaper and it's going to ruin your reputation so will ins can insurance help somehow what well, do you, you know it's, it's funny because I'm I'm going to be presenting to one of the big insurance um aggregators, I would say, to uh, underwriters to say if companies will use these services that are available to them, they should get a discount on their policies. So yes, they should have uh, insurance. It's not going to fix the brand necessarily, but it could fix the, you know, help the pocketbook. Right. And if you can go into your insurance company and demonstrate you're actually doing things right, then maybe you can negotiate some better pricing as well. Uh, and just like in other aspects of risk, risk management, insurance is a part of the story. Uh, the brand damage is uninsurable. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, we're almost out of time. Any final thoughts? Um, encouragement, you can do it, and it's fun, actually. Privacy is fun, so you should take it as a business differentiator, especially if you're a startup. Well, what and, are you and our tagline is privacy and permission equal trust. And I've been saying that for 16 years when people didn't even know what I was talking about when I was... Uh, chatting about privacy and the importance of, of these things. So, you know, if, if, if as the consumer and then these startups, if the consumer feels that trust, feels like they, there's transparency, they're going to provide you with information that's going to let you provide a better service to them. And if you uh, throw that trust out the window, then they'll be quick to turn you off. Yep, and there's so many kind of uh, intangibles associated with wins that you get from being a trusted um, company around data. I mean, we, we feel this every day at Mozilla. Uh, we, it opens doors that, with both users and in other places that you just can't open without uh, strong and good uh, data practices. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely worth it. Oh, great. Well, one last tip I want to share with startups, uh, Numity and IPP, they both have great free resources available for privacy professionals. So check it out, Numity and IPP. So great free resources. Well, thank you so much, Jishnu and Denise. I, it's, my, it's been fun. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and experiences. Thank you both. Thank you.